Coming up on American Black Journal, another historic designation for Detroit's WGPR TV 62. Plus, we'll remember Karen Hudson Samuels, the driving force behind the preservation of WGPR and Black history here in the city. Also, we'll hear about this year's Sphinx competition for classical musicians of color. Don't go away. American Black Journal starts right now. From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Ally, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever and viewers like you. Thank you. Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. The country's first African-American owned and operated television station received a special honor during this Black History Month. Detroit's WGPR TV 62, which is now a broadcast museum and Michigan historical landmark, was placed on the National Register of Historic Places. Sadly, the good news was followed by the tragic loss of a founding member of the WGPR TV Historical Society, Executive Director Karen Hudson Samuels. Family and friends gathered at the station this past week to release balloons in Karen's memory and to stroll through the museum that she worked so hard to create. I spoke with the president of the WGPR Historical Society, Joe Spencer, about the void left by Karen's passing and the legacy of this wonderful television station. Joe Spencer, welcome to American Black Journal. Well, thank you, Steve. It's uh, so it's nice to be here today. Thank you very much. Yeah. So let's start with uh, our deepest condolences here at uh, Detroit Public Television and American Black Journal uh, to you at WGPR uh, for the, the the passing of Karen Hudson Samuels. Uh, I, I was stunned as everybody was to learn uh, that, that she had died, and I've said a couple times uh, over the past week that uh, Karen and and you, to some extent, I, I, I kind of considered you guys uh, almost co-host of American Black Journal, and certainly <laughs> part of the American Black Journal family, because you're, you're on so much, uh, and you've you've contributed so much to the work that we do here, uh, trying to preserve. Uh, Black culture and history and lift up Black voices. Uh, so, so just personally, uh, the sense of loss uh, from Karen dying is is just really, really hard to, to imagine. So again, uh, our deepest condolences to you guys. Thank you, Steve. Um, yes, it's, it's a great loss for, for me personally, because Karen and I have been friends since 1976 when she first started with uh, WGPR, and of course, it's a, it's a great loss to the museum. It's a great loss to uh, you know the the city of Detroit because Karen had so much involvement in so many different things. You know, as you say, she's been on your show for a lot of reasons for all kinds of projects that she's been involved in. But not only not only with the, the museum, but but also with the, the uh, Black Historical Sites Committee and and uh, just other things that she she was engaged in, which. Uh, you know, had her involved in a lot of things that you found uh, uh, interesting enough to bring on to, and to present to your public. And so yeah. we appreciate that. We appreciate you as well. And thank you for your condolences. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, the timing, though, of, of, of her passing, uh, I think, reminds us of 
again, the power of the work that she did, this designation of WGPR uh, as a national historic site. And, and it's happening in large part because of, uh, because of the work she did. It absolutely was because of the work she did. Karen worked tirelessly to, uh, to bring WGPR's museum up and more awareness in the public. And she was the one who started the whole effort to get us designated as such and went to all the meetings and did all of the stuff that she had to do to make it happen. She did the same thing to get us designated as a Michigan historical uh, site. So it was absolutely uh, her work and it's huge for us. I mean, it's just absolutely huge for WGPR to be, uh, to be promoted to that status to be now be designated as a, as a historical site and to be listed. You know, I, I had a meeting, uh, not a meeting, but a, uh, an interview the other day by, by way of phone from a person from the National Geographic uh, that wanted to do a story now on us now that we're designated as a national historic site. So it, it's, it's, uh, she, um, she absolutely, you know, she jammed, she banged it up and then she dropped the mic. You know, she gone and, <laughs> to glory, you know, and, and she, she will never be forgotten. She will always be uh, a part of what we've done and to, to much of, of our success has been credited to her. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I feel like I've lived through with you guys the, the, the journey uh, of the museum from an idea uh, to uh, sort of opening and now to his existence and now this uh, this national historic site but 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 catch us up uh, on where you are with uh, with the museum and especially how the disruption of the pandemic uh, has played out uh, for, for you guys well uh, yes we we have been disrupted by the uh, by the pandemic um, we closed at certain times because um, the the radio station closed because mm -hmm. you know we are housed in the WGPR uh, FM's uh, radio station building, mm -hmm. and so we did have to close. But we are currently open. We are open every Friday and uh, every first Saturday of the month. So um, uh, we will continue that. And in fact, we are now even discussing of expanding the amount of days that we're open. And we're we're really going to make a big thrust to get. Uh, more people involved so that we can expand the amount of time that we are available for the public to see us, especially with the new designation. It's, we think it's really important. Yeah. Uh, and of course, uh, as somebody who grew up here in the city uh, for the 70s and 80s, uh, I have incredibly vivid memories uh, of WGPR TV and all of the groundbreaking television that, that, that came out of it. But, but just as I said in the open, the idea of the, the, the first uh, black owned and operated television station uh, that's right here in the city of Detroit is something you just can't, you can't overstate the importance uh, of that and, and of preserving that history uh, for people to, to be able to go and see and touch now. Yeah, before Barton, before uh, BET, and so much of the, of the media that we're seeing now, WGPR was the very first. And you know, we were also the first to do some things that hadn't been done in broadcasting and not in the Detroit market. For example, we were the first television station to use uh, digital video cameras, that is, uh, for news uh, collection. Nobody, everybody else was using film. We were the first to use video. We were the first station to uh, go on the air uh, 24 hours. Uh, used to be, you know, one o'clock, everybody put up that little signal, you get that beep, and hey, they were off the air until six, seven o'clock in the morning. We were the first to do that. And of course, we uh, produced a lot of our programming because we had no network affiliation. So therefore, we had to fill our hours with programming of all sorts. We did have syndicated programming and we did have films and those kind of things, but we produced an awful lot of talk shows, dance, we had the dance shows, entertainment shows. Karen, in fact, at one time hosted a, a program called uh, uh, Black Theater. Mm -hmm. And it uh, featured films from the 30s and 40s that, that were produced and starred black, uh, black people in it. So, you know, we just had a lot of programming that, that nobody else was doing and we did a lot more of it. And as a result of that, we also gave a lot of young African-American men and women 
their first opportunity to be brought into the world of broadcasting, their first opportunity to produce a, a show, to write a script, to appear on camera, to operate a camera, you know? And as a result of that, many of these people went on to have wonderful co careers in, in broadcasting. And I think you know one or two of those people as well that uh, had that, uh, that uh, benefit and uh, have been a great contributor to black media in this town and, and to media in general. Um, you know, uh, your producer, in fact, is uh, That's uh, right. got, got her start at, with WGPR and uh, just a fabulous person, this this staff, thank you, uh, Hughes. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's, it's been great, you know, and the journey from, uh, from the time that we just decided that, hey, that this is the legacy of WGPR should not go into the uh, into darkness and no one ever hear about it anymore and that we should do something to preserve that legacy. Uh, that journey from there to now being a, a designated historical site has been a wonderful journey. And you have been there for a good part of it, Steve, because uh, I think that from our very first public event, which was uh, when we had a fundraiser at the Detroit Historical Museum, you brought us on and you helped to share that and we had a very successful event and we just went on time after time with one event after another to eventually come to the point where we are now. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, Joe Spencer, congratulations again on uh, the National Historic Site designation. That is a huge deal uh, and a great way to honor not only uh, the museum, but of course, uh, Karen Hudson Samuels, uh, who passed recently. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here on American Black Journal. Thank you. America's first black variety show is being celebrated in a PBS documentary that's airing right here on Detroit Public Television on February 22nd at 10 p.m. The show was called Soul and it debuted on public television in 1968. The host and producer, Ellis Hazlip, created the groundbreaking show as a way to celebrate African-American contributions to the arts. The documentary is titled Mr. Soul. Take a look at a preview. I never forget when the show started and you strike up the band is this wow, you know, live and in color, the soul show. Live and in color from New York City, soul welcome. And now the very first musical performance of our show, Sarah Dash, Nona Hendrix, Patricia Hope, also known as Patti LaBelle and the Blue Bears. We look at the first show. Essentially, we got stars and future stars. Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells. Yes, they'd been around, but not on television. I don't know how to explain it. The air was electric. Let me tell you one and all. We were all very excited because we knew it was something new and special. The very first show starts and Novella Nelson's face is the face of the introductory sequence. Ellis would bring in people who he had seen or heard or knew. Novella Nelson, who had never been on television. It would be heaven for a cat. A cold water flat. And then there was Billy Taylor, who was known in the jazz world, but not in the television world. We were so excited about someone who, at last, was beginning to do something that really wasn't done often enough for us on radio and television, and helping people understand what black music was about. Ellis did that very well. And the moment that went on that television, it went boom, you know, we bad. Ain't we bad? Yeah. You walk down, you walk down the street and you were dripping badness, you know. <laughs>
Again, Mr. Soul airs Monday, February 22nd at 10 p.m. That same night, you can also watch a replay of this year's Sphinx competition beginning at 9. The Sphinx organization brings together young Black and Latinx classical string players to compete for cash prizes and the chance to perform with major orchestras. This year's finals concert was a virtual event because of the pandemic. We spoke with Andre Dowell, Chief of Artist Engagement at Sphinx. So the Sphinx competition is, of course, one of my favorite events of every year. I just love not only the celebration of uh, black and brown young people and their love of classical music, but boy, the elevation of uh, these performances and the skill level that is on display always just uh, just blows my mind. Um, uh, and, and this year, of course, is, uh, is no different, but talk about what's different about this year because of uh, the pandemic. We're not able to do uh, Sphinx quite the way we're used to. Absolutely. And, you know, the talent every year has always increased. And that's something that we are very proud of in terms of how we're able to recruit new musicians to enter the competition and bring them here to really give them the tools that they need to succeed. Of course, this year is like no other um, in terms of the pandemic and being able to shift. How does the Sphinx competition look and how do we adjust and adapt to today? I mean, that's something that we've always done with our Sphinx competition and our organization work that we do is how can we adapt to make sure that we are staying relevant while also providing the support to the musicians. So, so this year, um, we were able to keep the competition and go virtual. Um, as most people who have followed the competition know that we are able to usually bring in an entire 60 member orchestra, uh, the Sphinx Symphony Orchestra who comes in and acts as mentors to some of these musicians. Unfortunately, we, we weren't able to do that with the pandemic, but we were able to shift things so that the musicians still had master classes with some of the world's greatest judges that we have been able to bring in. And so this year, um, basically what happened, the format was such that the musicians were able to record their works in their own home space. Traditionally, they would come to Detroit at the Orchestra Hall, the Maxim Fisher Madrias Music Center. They would come there uh, to do the competition. But this year, they were able to do things from their own home. We provided the support that they needed in terms of recordings um, and just kind of walked them through that process. And we were able to actually reach a wider audience because everything is virtual or everything was virtual for the competition. So we were able to reach new audiences, reach out to some new venues and partners to ensure that they had students. And, and people attending the, the competition as well. So it's, it's been great. Um, and hopefully next year we'll be able to do it back in person again. But if not, we're set up for success from this year for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, so talk about the level of competition uh, this year. That's always, uh, I think, the, the, the real highlight of, of, of Sphinx. As you say, it gets better and better each year. Yeah, yeah. The level of competition um, is, re is really something that comes from, you know, the musicians themselves. Sphinx puts the musicians in a place where they feel supported, mm -hmm. um, and where they feel valued. And I think that's something that's really important, not just in arts, but just in life in general, is for people to feel valued so that they can put their best foot forward. So from our end, we want to make sure that they have, you know, access to a hall if they need a hall to record or recording equipment. Um, in this particular case, um, piano accompanist and not, and for them not to worry about, you know, having to pay for those types of things. We provide that type of support for them as well. So as long as Sphinx is doing, you know, as long as we're doing our job of making the musicians feel valued and supporting them, then they have the opportunity to really focus on their art and their craft so that they can be in the practice room or being with their teachers and studying scores and music and listening and really preparing for the competition. And that's one of the main ways that uh, and reasons how and why the competition um, this year was very competitive in both the junior and the senior division. Um, I think the jury panel had a very hard time um, deciding, you know, first, second and third place this year. Any, anyone could have won in, in this year. Yeah. And of course, the idea of Sphinx is to, as you say, give people the opportunity and a showcase uh, for their talent. But, but the goal really uh, is to increase the numbers of, uh, of black and brown kids who, A, want to do this, right, want to be musicians, 
and, uh, and also have the opportunity uh, to, to get to that high, that high level. Uh, talk just a little bit about how we're doing uh, with that. When Sphinx started, of course, we were in a really different place. Uh, where are we in uh, 2021? Yeah, I'll, I'll say in 2021 that we have seen some changes happening across the field. Of course, we do have a long way to go still. Um, as you said, uh, the Sphinx organization is really to support the artists. And so we've been able to do it in a host of ways, some of them through not just the Sphinx competition, but also through some of the programs where the people who participate in the Sphinx competition are able to have an impact. So for example, um, the winners of the competition are able to play with some of our partner orchestras. Well, the great thing about that is when they go to play with partner orchestras in a different community, they are now reaching other students and not just students, but other audi audiences, audience members, teachers, uh, patrons, um, who can not only uh, experience it, but also see uh, black and brown musicians on stage. And that's a very important part of this um, that gets lost in the shuffle sometimes is that it's not just about talking about it, but we have to actually see it on stage. And so we've seen an increase um, through some of those efforts. Of course, there's, there's a long way to go. I mean, and a lot of programs that we have to support, not just on the musician side, but also the artistic administration side as well. I mean, so those are things that we continually will put in place. And as I said before, continue to adapt and evolve what we do as an organization. Yeah, and of course, uh, classical music uh, as a field, as a profession, uh, is changing too in terms of the opportunities that exist. Uh, orchestras don't look like they did uh, just five or, or, or 10 years ago. And I, I think one of the fears is that those changes also make it more difficult to, to maintain access uh, to, to those who, had, who didn't have it uh, before. Uh, talk about how we're doing with, with the change in, in classical music uh, and maintaining uh, that black and brown presence. Yeah, well, there's a lot of changes that are happening, especially in terms of how the, when we talk about entry points into classical music, of course, that's changed. When we talk about who's even coming to the concerts, of course, that, change, that, that has changed over the years as well. And that starts from a place um, of understanding and commitment by the organizations, not just from the musicians who you see on stage, not just the administrators who are behind the scenes, but also from a board level as well. So when we're talking about the changes over the past five to 10 years, from our perspective, we're actually pushing orchestras to have those conversations at the board of directors level, at the full-time staff level, the part-time staff level, um, even in terms of the vendors that you're able to bring in. Because when you really diversify in that way, and, and you talk about vendors and you talk about you know, the board presence, you're bringing in outside sources that would have otherwise not been able or even thought about coming into that type of environment. And so those are the types of changes that we would like to see and, and to continue over the next five to 10 years one of the things that we are really tackling right now is the idea of how orchestras are um, doing their audition processes and things of that nature. Um, and so that's something that we're really focused on right now, um, orchestra audition processes, um, how you are recruiting artistic administrators, how are you recruiting your boards, ensuring that you're not keeping things uh, uh, in a circle, in terms of your circle of, of friends and people that you know, we have to look outside of the bubble and create opportunity. And that's what the Sphinx organization is about. That's what the competition is about, is really creating opportunities and providing that support for everyone. That is going to do it for us this week. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about our guests at AmericanBlackJournal.org, and you can always connect with us on Facebook and on Twitter. We're going to leave you with a performance by the first place winner in the junior division at the Sphinx competition, Amarin Olmeda. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time.
From Delta faucets to bare paint, Masco Corporation is proud to deliver products that enhance the way consumers all over the world experience and enjoy their living spaces. Masco, serving Michigan communities since 1929. Support also provided by the Cynthia and Etzel Ford Fund for Journalism at Detroit Public TV. The DTE Foundation proudly supports 50 years of American Black Journal in covering African American history, culture, and politics. The DTE Foundation and American Black Journal partners in presenting African American perspectives about our communities and in our world. Also brought to you by AAA, Nissan Foundation, Ally, Impact at Home, UAW Solidarity Forever, and viewers like you. Thank you.